passages. Uh, this is uh, what is known as the triumphal entry. Uh, Jesus Christ was traveling with his disciples. They were making their way back towards Jerusalem. And uh, so he has been performing miracles. Uh, he's been uh, teaching. And uh, no doubt uh, his reputation has preceded him. Wherever he goes now, people are starting to realize and recognize who he is. Uh, the statements that are being made about him are... Uh, many different types of statements. Some as far as uh, he's just another cult group leader. Uh, some would be that he is genuinely the Messiah. He is the one we've been waiting for. Uh, others would say he's just a guy who's stirring up trouble. And, uh, and so he had both the religious leaders of, of that, that area watching him and he had the Roman soldiers watching him. Because anytime a crowd would be uh, in session, uh, the Roman government who was in charge at that time wanted to know what was going on. And so there are many eyes watching him. But again, if you could perform some miracles, no doubt, uh, people would start paying attention. And as he taught, uh, he taught that he was on a mission from his father in heaven. And so we, we can look, and again, we're just getting one little snapshot of uh, the information that we can uh, deal with here this morning. And so if you would, allow me just to read a portion of the text, and then I want to read you some background information, and then I want to talk to you this morning about the subject of a passionate expectation, a passionate expectation. So if you would, in Matthew chapter 21, skip down with me, if you would, for the sake of time, to verses 8 and 9, Matthew 21, verses 8 and 9, and it says, And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, as I come before you this morning as one who many years ago put my faith and trust in you, and there's not a question in my mind, those who knew me at the time and in myself, there was a change that took place in my life, a spiritual change. I finally had confidence in who you were. I finally understood that my sin debt was forgiven. I no longer lived in the guilt of my past sins. And I understood that I would have an eternity with you someday when I died. And Lord, I'm so thankful for that day where I finally understood that message of the gospel and trusted you. And here we find in your text that you've recorded for us the interactions that you had with mankind on the earth at that time. Some understood who you were and rejected it. Some did not understand who you were and just walked away. Some understood who you were and received you. And Lord, I realize that in this group here today, this auditorium, we have the same crowds represented. Some have willfully and openly received you. Some have heard the message and have rejected you. They just don't believe. Others are maybe seeking and trying to figure out if this is true or not and have questions. Holy Spirit of God, we need you to work in our hearts. We need you to convince us of the truth. And so we ask that today as we just go over this one part of the story leading up to your crucifixion and your resurrection... You would please help us to be passionate about finding out if this is true or not in our own hearts and our own minds. Well, thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Early this morning, we had the privilege of meeting in, with the uh, table groups, and I was leading one of the discussions there at our table group and talking about the faith of Abraham and how Abraham, his faith was counted to him for righteousness. And Abraham, being an Old Testament uh, person, was looking forward and he was believing in the promises that God had given to him. And, it, and the Bible tells in Galatians that his faith was counted as righteousness, meaning he was made right with God based on his faith. And I asked our table group, I said, what is significant about Abraham's faith compared to our faith today? And how do, you, how do we see the comparison there of Abraham's faith and our faith? And, and we look back to the cross of Jesus Christ, that event that changed, if you would, the uh, understanding of, of, of Christianity, if you would, of the fact of God's plan. Uh, before the world was even uh, formed, God had this plan that he would send forth his son, 
being equal with him in every aspect. Jesus is fully God. There is nothing less about Jesus than God the Father or God the Spirit. Yet he chose to come to this earth and he chose to be the one to lay down his life in order to pay for my sin debt, for your sin debt, for the sin debts of the world. And we recognize in the time that they were in, Roman oppression was at its peak. Roman soldiers had walked the streets of Jerusalem trying to keep the crowds in check. It was an oppressive time for the nation of Israel. They were, while they were there, they did not want Rome to be in charge of them, but they had to submit because of the force behind the Roman soldiers. There are many attempts by vigilante type groups and, and groups that wanted to uh, destroy Roman rule and cause wreak havoc from the Jewish side. Uh, they would kill soldiers from time to time, causing then the Roman soldiers to come in and just wipe out whole groups of people. One uh, story uh, that has been uh, recorded in history, at one time over 2,000 uh, people uh, were hung on crosses to, to try to just squash any rebellions that would, would spring up in that area. They were cruel uh, to those who would um, go up against the Roman authority of that day. And it would be the same type of crucifixion that Jesus Christ would, would face, although his was much more severe and brutal. But we recognize that during this time, it was a great time of uh, unrest. Uh, the Roman emperors who were stationed there from time to time would try to make peace with the religious groups of that day, the Jews being the largest religious group in that community. And so they would try to make peace, but the, the, the Jews would obey them, but inside they resented them being there. And so it was a very harsh type of um, uh, 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 environment during this time. Now you have a new leader, if you would, coming on the scene, Jesus Christ, as he's going from place to place, knowing Jewish tradition, being raised in Jewish tradition, religion. His father, his mother are faithful Jewish uh, practicers, and so he would have been as well. Jesus did obeyed the law, did everything he was, it was required of him, but now he's starting to teach differently. And of course, this now gets the attention of the Jewish leaders of his day, and very soon Jesus becomes an enemy of the Jewish leaders. And so we see not only is the Roman government watching Jesus and his followers, but also the Jewish leaders are watching Jesus and his followers, and they could not explain away the miracles. They could not explain away his teaching that was absolutely scriptural, and he was counted as wiser than their, their best teachers. And they could not fathom how this Jesus could be so powerful in this way, but yet so meek. He was not coming trying to flex his authority or his abilities, but yet he was just quietly ministering to people and serving in a way and performing miracles and whatnot. They were evidencing the fact that he was different than any man on the earth. But we recognize that the Pharisees, being the religious leaders of that day, knew a Messiah would come someday. An anointed one would come someday and he would be the deliverer of the nation of Israel. And yet, at this time, the religious leaders would not believe that Jesus Christ was that one. As I suppose would be the same in our day and age. If somebody popped on the screen today saying that they were a prophet or that they were God or sent from God, all of us would have a question like, okay, right. So, like, likely in their day, that was kind of a sentiment, if you would. But what happens is the, Jew, the leading Jews of that day refused to believe so they set out to discredit Jesus Christ. And it wasn't that they were just going to discredit him because their attempts at discrediting him were not received. So they came up with another plan. Their plan was to eliminate him. He was too much of a threat to their way of life, to what they believed. They weren't content just let him go on. They wanted to put him to death. If you look with me at John chapter 11, and verses, uh, beginning in verse number 45, we see how this came to be according to the scriptures. John chapter 11 and verse number 45 reads, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, the next three words, believed on him. What happened just prior to this event was Jesus raised a man from the dead. This man was dead. He was in the tomb for three days. There was no question he was dead. He, they went through all the, the proper rituals to bury someone like this. There was, it was already established. They were already uh, marking the grave. It was done. Jesus shows up and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus hops out of the grave and is 
clothes. And that's where we pick it up in verse 45, that many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things, that miracle and other miracles which Jesus did, they believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees and the council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and do what? Take away both our place and nation. Here's really what was at the heart of these religious leaders of the day. They were fearful they were going to lose their authority amongst the people and they were going to lose their position amongst the Roman uh, government that they worked so hard to get to. They were more concerned about losing their positions and actually even considering, does Jesus Christ really fulfill all that the Old Testament scriptures point to as a Messiah coming someday? And just like today, there are still people that are doubters. They say, come on, all the miracles, all the Bibles, all the talk. You know, you Christians can't even get along. And hey, they have a lot to shoot at. They're right. Sometimes, sadly, we as Christians have made our testimony as God followers the worst. Why? Well, we know we're imperfect, but when you claim to be a Christian, you claim to be a follower of God, people think that you're going to act differently. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And so there's a lot for them to use as evidence against us, and that's sadly true. But that doesn't change the fact that God is true, that Jesus is true, that He does save and He does change lives. And so it goes on to say here, after understanding that the Jews were fearful of losing their clout, their authority, their position, verse number 49 then says, and one of them named Caiaphas, he would have been the chief priest, the high priest, that same year said to them, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that this is expedient for us. Now you have to understand what he says next. He was sealing his own fate. He's not even recognizing what he's saying is directly falling in line with what was going to take place, whether he liked it or not. And here's what Caiaphas says, that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he, not of himself, but being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he should gather together in one the children of God under, uh, excuse me, the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. So here we have a religious leader. You say, wait a minute, a religious leader of the Jews is now putting out a death warrant against this man who's doing great works? Yeah. Why? And we have to understand this. In our day and age, we've watched religious re leaders rise up and do horrible things against people. All you have to do is look at TV and the newspapers today. I can tell you churches I've served in and, and seen religious leaders do some horrendous things, have to go to prison, say, well, what is it? Many times those people don't have faith, true faith of their own. They've been put into a position of authority. They've been put into a position of, of being, uh, enjoying the fact that they have authority over people and they're not there for the right purpose. They're more there for themselves than they are for God. And that happens, sadly, in many different positions. Look at our political system. Look at our religious system. But yet, a lot of people who are non-believers want to just blame all of Christianity, all of the God followers, and that doesn't mean that there's not some of us who really want to do right and really want to serve God and honor God with our life. And even some that I have known who have made horrendous, sinful actions against others, sadly, were true believers, but got caught up in something they shouldn't have been caught up in. And they should rightly lose their positions. They should rightly be removed from positions of, of power and suffer the penalties under our laws. But then sadly you have many people that try to protect them and cover things up and that's just wrong. Here we have a case in point. The Jewish leaders from the highest Jewish leader put out a death warrant against this man who was doing, they had nothing against him except that he was performing miracles, he was a better teacher than they were, he was gathering greater crowds, they felt he was a threat to what they worked so hard to get to at this point in their life. Where's the spiritual thinking in that? There wasn't, this was self-preservation now, self-protection. And so we find that this is 
where Jesus is during his time on this earth. And I want to just point out a couple of things before I give you the three main points here. If you would, turn with me to Psalm 118 or just follow along as I read out loud. Last Sunday night we read uh, from Psalms 113 to 118 as a uh, time of our prayer service. And knowing that that particular portion of Scripture goes along with the Passover feast that is still celebrated today by those of the Jewish uh, practice. And what we see here in Psalm 118, verses 25, 26, and 27, notice what it says. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be the, he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. And here we have a portion of scripture that goes right along with what, is going, what has already been said about Jesus Christ in his triumphal entry. So if you would now turn back with us to Matthew chapter 21, and we'll stay here for a little while, not to confuse you. In Matthew chapter 21, but I want to give you the background to this. And so you understand the background. It was a very tense time. The, the religious Jews were against Jesus Christ. The Roman government was against the Jews, but he was, they were also against any new groups forming because they wanted to control. They wanted to know what was going on. And so there was a lot of hostility taking place. But yet what Jesus was doing was ministering to people. He was teaching people. He was performing miracles. He was doing nothing against the law. He was doing nothing that would have uh, caused anyone to dislike him unless you had an axe to grind against what, what, the good things that he was performing or you had an ulterior motive. So I want you to notice here in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse number 1 now, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, this is Jesus now walking with his disciples. They're, they're coming from Jericho, where in Jericho, along the way, he just healed two blind men. And now he's coming to a place called Bethpage, under the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass, or a donkey, tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, the colt of a foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sent him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. So here we have the, the setup. Jesus is now leaving Jericho. He's going uh, towards Jerusalem. His disciples with him. And now crowds are starting to follow, hearing who he was and what miracles he has performed. Now, do the people all truly understand what he's going to do at this point? No. They're following the crowd. Something exciting is going on, and some of these people have been touched by his miracles. No doubt the blind men that he had healed. This is a 15 or 20 mile walk back to Jerusalem. They're following along, and uh, no doubt if you were blind from your birth, and now all of a sudden you could see, you'd be excited, you'd be enthusiastic, and you'd want to have a part in this guy's life. And so the, there are no doubt many people were hearing of the great miracles and he was having crowds follow him. And as they get closer to Jerusalem, people on their own started taking it upon themselves thinking this man no doubt is royalty. This man is truly different than anyone. And so you can imagine in groups of people, sometimes uh, you ever played that old game, the telephone game where somebody would start a conversation by the time it got to the end, it was a totally different story. Uh, can you imagine what would be going on in a group like this as throngs and multitudes are following along? And then what is going on also in Jerusalem is the Passover week. So people are coming from all over different countries, Jews coming back to participate in the mandatory celebration of the Passover. So crowds are just coming from everywhere. They're looking for places to stay. And word is spreading that this Jesus who's performed miracles and teaches like nobody else is also coming in this crowd. And so the crowd gets whipped up into a frenzy. Think about this. 
They want out of Roman oppression. Many of the religious Jews are so fed up with the religious leaders of their day because they knew that these men were in it for themselves, not truly for God. And they were getting so sick and tired of what they were hearing and, and the rules that were put upon them. There was no relationship with God. And so to now have someone who possibly could be the deliverer, somebody who could, could somehow come in and perform miracles like this and teach and people are starting to talk, is this the prophet? Is this the Messiah? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? And so the more, the closer they're getting to Jerusalem, the more intense uh, the conversations, the more excitement that's building to a point where people started taking their coats off their backs. The closer they got to seeing the Jerusalem gates there, they took off their coats, laid them on the ground. They took their palm fronds. And again, they would have been much bigger than this. They would have been giant spread out leaves. But I didn't think I could bring that many in the auditorium here this morning. Uh, so they would have had these giant uh, palm fronds. They would be thrown out. And basically what they were doing, they were laying out the red carpet treatment for Jesus Christ. Did they fully understand who he was? No. And that's obvious by our story. They were saying things, though, like the son of David. You have to understand, if you study the scriptures, that phrase, son of David, means he is the rightful heir to the throne. That is a statement you didn't just make flippantly in that day. The fact that they would say anything that would, that would tie him to a messianic promise was dangerous for them to say something like that with the religious leaders listening in and knowing they had it out for Jesus Christ. Or for the Roman soldiers who were there around them saying, you're calling this guy your king? Well, we only have one king. Who is this guy? And so a lot of eyes watching and observing this, this thing uh, take place. And so I, I give you this background and, and just so you understand what's, what, what hype is building here. And so let me give you my first point dealing with this message on a passionate expectation. The first point I want to lead you, is, pa uh, leave you with is passion can lead to faulty expectations. Passion can lead to faulty expectations. Here we have a group of people, no doubt, passionate. If you've ever been around practicing Jews, are they or are they not passionate people about their faith? Oh yeah, very passionate and willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you or just ignore you totally. They're very bold and blunt people, very passionate, though, about their faith. And you recognize that was the mentality of these people. The sad thing was faulty expectations can lead to problems. And their faulty expectation was that this Jesus was going to come in and he was going to deliver them at that moment. And they were looking for him to be set up right then and there as their deliverer. How many of you have ever taken your kids to a, a store? Some of you are like, I'm not sure I want to raise my hand on this. Where's he going? All right, I'm not, you're not in trouble. Well, we've had five kids, so we've, we've taken kids to the store. And it's interesting that sometimes kids can have in their mind an expectation that you, in your mind, had no expectation that was similar to their expectation. So you go into the store, you put the kid in the car, you start walking down the aisles, and you know, the, the child says to you, Mommy or Daddy, are you going to get me that toy? And he's like, what toy are you talking about? Well, last time we came to the store, you said, maybe next time. Well, this is the next time, so are you getting me in that toy? It's like, what do you not understand about maybe? That's the parent's way of saying no nicely, okay, kid? And so you go through this little dramatic uh, uh, presentation with your kids, trying to let them down as nice as you can, but you just realize that in their mind, their expectation was, last time we went to the store, you said maybe. And to any Red-blooded American kid maybe means yes in my mind. We're going to get that next time we come to the store. So the kids go through the aisles and, and they keep, you know, you know your kids as well as my kids. Man, they'll ask you a hundred different ways. I mean, so are you saying no, not right now? No, not right now. Next aisle. How about now? Like, kid, we're not even out of the store yet. No. And your kids will try everything to get you or to try to convince you, connive you. And some of you parents, you're just guilted into it like, fine, take it. No? Okay, we'll move on. So we, we recognize, though, that sometimes the expectations from people are different than the reality. And I believe that the expectations of many of these people being whooped up into a frenzy of enthusiasm and excitement that Jesus possibly could be the one who's going to deliver them from the oppression they were facing right then and there. For a moment, I'd like you to take that palm frond that's in front of you or on your lap or whatever. I'm just going to look at it, obviously. It is a pretty amazing plant. Uh, I'll give $1,000 to anyone who could take their fingers and just pull it straight apart and rip it. 
Go ahead, Joey, try it. It's not going to happen. So, uh, but anyways, um, they're, they're pretty amazing as far as uh, how many things they've been used for, what you can make them, what you can do with them. But I want you to look at this and just understand for a minute, these people, as they were going into Jerusalem, laying these palm fronds down on the ground, making the red carpet treatment for Jesus Christ, there was a mixed meaning or mixed understanding by that whole group of people. I want you to understand, first of all, that some of these people were looking at Jesus as being the one who was just going to deliver them from oppression. And so that palm frond, if you would, as they're laying it down, as these people are laying it down, this, this one person is laying down saying, I can't wait, he's going to deliver us from Roman oppression. Another person lays their palm frown down and they say, I can't wait. He's going to deliver me from that mean old high priest. He always is putting out rules on us. Another one puts it down and says, I can't wait for him to stick it to the Pharisees. They just keep coming up with more rules and more rules and more rules. I can see someone else laying down and says, man, I, as I put this down, I just can't wait. Maybe he's going to set the kingdom today. He's going to just wipe out the face of the earth and everyone's going to come. We're going to worship him today and he's going to, you know, the sky is going to split wide open. There are probably so many different thoughts as Jesus was marching into, or riding the, the donkey into Jerusalem. I want you to just for a moment look at that strand that's in, in your, your hand there and say, okay, what misconceptions do you have about Jesus Christ? Is there a misconception that you have? Well, pastor, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer, so I think he's a mean God. Well, pastor, you know, I've heard you preach so many times about the gospel and, and trusting Jesus Christ. And you know what, pastor, in my mind, that just doesn't make any sense. My father-in-law was a, a NASA engineer, wonderful man, moral man, good man. We had conversations about, about the Lord and, and about stories from the scriptures from time to time. And he said, John, you really believe that stuff? And I said, yeah, dad, I really do. And for him, he says, no, A plus B has to equal C, has to be proven. And we had some great conversations, and fortunately, later in his life, he did trust the Lord as his Savior, but I found, when we were going through his stuff, a Bible that was given to him by uh, a Sunday school teacher when he was about nine years old, and in it was written scriptures about the gospel, and, and he had told me, he said, I went to church as a kid, but he, he went to an engineering school, and, and he said, uh, my education kind of educated me out, out of God. And I thought, I thought that was really sad. But some of you are the same way. Your education or your lack of experience of Christianity or bad experience with Christians has turned you off. I get that. But there are so many mixed messages as people are laying down their coats and laying down the palm fronds and they're waiting for Jesus to do something miraculous to deliver them at that time from Roman oppression. And so we see, first of all, that there is a passion that can lead to faulty expectations. Were, were their expectations accurate when they were worshiping Jesus? Oh, the word Hosanna that they were shouting means save now. Can you imagine throngs of people as Jesus is being ushered through the gates into Jerusalem? The Roman soldiers are around keeping crowd control. The Jewish leaders are there watching and observing Jesus. And all these people are coming in. You had faithful Jewish people who didn't like Jesus. And you had uh, non-believers who were just watching this take place. You had market keepers and on and on. People who were following Jesus. Those who were healed. So many different ideas of what was going on. And as they were marching through, they were saying, Hosanna on the highest. They were saying, save now, Jesus. And that would have got the attention of those who were critical of who he was. It would have got the attention even of the faithful to, say, to state something like that. And so we see that their passions motivate them, but they had a faulty, understand, a faulty um, expectation. Secondly, I want you to notice that the passion can cause misguided understanding. I know these are similar, but just bear with me here. Jesus' purpose for coming to this earth was to fulfill prophecy. It's been, it was told to us in the scriptures many times that he came to fulfill prophecy, to complete the law. And we have many Old Testament prophecies, many, many Old Testament prophecies that came fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But Jesus came riding on a donkey, as it lists there in our text, which is a quote from Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9 which was approximately 400 years before this event. 
speaking of a deliverer who would come. And so as you read verses 9 and 10 of Matthew 21, you realize that is a, a, is a uh, depiction of that which came uh, earlier, many years earlier. And that was just one of the ways in which Jesus was uh, uh, fulfilling prophecy. But I want you to also notice something. Riding in on a donkey was something that was different than what some emperors would do. Most emperors would come riding in on a white stallion, representing that they were not only someone of nobility, but it was also somebody who had power and authority behind them as a warrior. And we notice that though, even at times, back in the Bible times, many kings who had a reputation of being warriors sometimes would ride in on a donkey so that that people would know, hey, I'm coming in as a person of peace. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He came in demonstrating that he was coming in as a person of peace, not of hostility, of war. And it says in Zechariah chapter 9 and 10, verse, uh, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 9, he says, He shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea to even to sea. And it speaks of Jesus being one who is coming in to speak peace. Even our text says that uh, Luke chapter 2, verse number 14, a text that goes along with um, Mary receiving word that she would be bearing Jesus Christ. Glory to God in the highest on earth. Peace. Goodwill towards men. Why? Because Jesus was coming as someone who wanted to offer peace to mankind. And yet many times the misunderstanding, misguided understanding from passionate people is no, he's, he's, he's just a, a person who's just all about himself or he just, he just wants to come in and, and cause trouble. And that was a misguided understanding at that particular time. And then I want you to notice lastly, passion can cause one to actually meet expectations. Passion can cause one to actually meet their expectations. Sometimes we can be passionate about good things and that passion can drive us to do what's right and it can motivate us to keep going until something is achieved. And I want you to notice in John chapter 12 and verse number 23, if you turn there with me, I want you to notice this about Jesus Christ. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. And if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He uses that illustration because they were an agricultural society. And if you ever planted a seed, you would understand, as the seed goes into the ground, that husk or shell that's around it actually uh, drops off or, or uh, 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 separates from the actual seed. That seed then is allowed to germinate and then bring forth life. And what he's using that as an illustration that he himself would have to die in order to bring forth life. In verse number 25 it says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that keepeth his life, life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life, a life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I came unto this hour. And notice what he says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. See, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he submitted himself to the Father, And he walked this earth and he suffered what you and I would suffer, but yet he was still 100% God. And he was willing to go through the pains of death and he was willing to go through the suffering he faced here on earth in order to glorify his Father which is in heaven. So that he might be glorified once again when he returned to his throne. So here we find that passion can cause one to meet the expectations. Jesus was one that was able to meet the expectations that were put upon him as coming to be the Savior of the world. But still, the choice comes down to us. Do you believe Jesus Christ, who he is? Have you made the decision to trust him as your own personal Savior? The Bible speaks many more things about Jesus Christ in his preparation for crucifixion. Again, when the angel came to Mary, she told him that the name of your son will be Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. 
Jesus Christ was the literal presence of God on the earth. The word Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah God, Luke chapter 2, verse 11, called Him Lord, called Him Christ, called Him the Savior. Many things pointed that Jesus Christ would be different than any other man. The apostle, or, or John, the, the, John the Baptist, we call him, in a prophetic statement, said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. All statements, many statements made about Jesus Christ were identify him as different than a regular man and separated out for a particular purpose. And his passion was to go fulfill the purpose of glorifying his Father. The book of Hebrews that we've been studying points Jesus out as the great high priest and the last high priest necessary to bear the sins of all mankind, to intercede on our behalf. He's called an intercessor. He's called the Redeemer. He's called the Savior. All these things point to Jesus Christ being the one that these people were worshiping as he came into Jerusalem, but they did not fully understand it. They were looking for immediate deliverance from their problems. And maybe today that palm frond in front of you could represent, well, I came to church because I need to get off of alcohol, or I came to church because I need my wife to to just leave me alone. I came to church and maybe you have some other significance of this palm frond in your life and you're not just coming to Jesus because of who he is and by faith following him, you have strings attached to it. You have an ulterior motive. And may I say to you, as sincerely as I can say to you, if you come to Jesus with ulterior motives, then your heart's not right. We need good, godly Christians that honestly want to live for God and do what's right based on what the Scriptures reveal to us. We have enough bad examples in leadership, in churches, Christians who claim to be, uh, or politicians who claim to be Christians who don't live the life, fellow Christians and believers in the workforce and schools that don't live it. And yes, there are many people watching and saying, you guys are a bunch of fakes. And I understand why they say that. But in reality, we're sinful people who can be delivered from our sin debt and have a full faith in Jesus Christ because He is the one who came. Even though they did not fully understand it in their time and they were misguided, they were passionate people, but it wasn't until Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And those people finally got it. They finally could say, now I understand. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I don't know what your position is on Jesus Christ today, but in conclusion, let me just read a couple statements or a couple questions. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that Jesus offers true eternal forgiveness for your sin debt? Do you believe that Jesus wants a real relationship with you right now? Are you willing to live for Jesus right now and deny yourself? Are you willing to honor Him with your life? right now and only you can answer those questions God's not going to twist your arm he's not going to force us to follow him it's something that you're convinced of inside your heart by faith and I can tell you as for many many years now of being one who keeps growing in my faith it is so worth it to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and to follow him are you going to be perfect absolutely not I am not perfect but you should be living your life to honor God more and more and more as you grow in this faith. What I want to do with this palm frond is, if we could have the pianist play, you don't have to participate, but what I was thinking of doing just as an opportunity for you presenting to Jesus maybe a misguided understanding of who you think Jesus Christ is, or perhaps... You're battling or fighting something in your own life right now and maybe you have had questions about who Jesus is or what God is doing in your life. And, and I don't know how it exactly work in your personal situation, but what I was going to ask is as the pianist plays that we would all stand and just come down the center aisle and drop off your palm frond and whatever God has put on your heart that as you're walking, you're just praying, Lord, it might be a prayer of forgiveness. It might be a prayer of true faith. It might be asking the Lord to work in some way in your life. And as you come forward, you just drop your palm frond there in this basket up front. And then just go back to your seat as we'll conclude here in just a moment. So 
not forcing you to participate, but let's all stand together. And if you're so desired, just come out of your aisles towards the center, come down and go back to your seats. And if you have a misconception of who Jesus Christ is, maybe you would just come and in an essence saying, Lord, help me in this area of my life or forgive me in this area of your life. Or perhaps this is the first time you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so you can just start, just come on down, just come to the center, walk to the front, just lay it down and just keep going around. Just as you're walking, pray, Lord, help me or forgive me or whatever it might be. One of the prayers that I pray often for those who are not believers is, Lord, is there something in my life that has caused someone to reject Christianity? Forgive me. Because if they watch me long enough, they'll see me stumble. But I want God to be glorified. I want people who are non-believers to come to know Jesus Christ. Perhaps as a Christian, you've had a poor testimony and say, Lord, forgive me. I've kind of taken advantage of who you are. Again, it's just an opportunity for us to just have a moment with the Lord and say, Lord, just like those going to Jerusalem had a misconception of who you are, I want to be genuine in my walk with you. I want to honor you with my life. Let me just to read a couple more verses before we conclude here. John chapter number 12 and verses 28. I left off with this. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And that idea that Jesus Christ, because of his going to the cross and suffering on the cross and being very resurrected, the drawing of all men, the message of the gospel is out there. But we must make a decision whether or not we'll believe Jesus Christ and trust Him as our Savior or not. And if you have expectations about Jesus Christ that are unrealistic or mis, mis, uh, disingenuous because of your own personality, issues that have taken place, I would ask you to seek Him honestly in your own heart, your own mind. Father, we thank You for the Word of God. We thank You that... You have given us the Word of God to study it, to understand what is the real expectation that you have of us. And the expectation is because your Son died on our behalf, we are to receive Him and to believe and to follow Him. Please, Lord, don't let us allow the bad testimonies of other Christians to thwart our desire to live for you. May we still be willing to honor and glorify you with our lives as Jesus glorified you by being obedient even unto death. We thank you for these many blessings you've given to us. May you help us to be a good witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.